the talk that I'm very, very excited to present to you today, I'm calling Tyrannosaurus Oddities, Beyond Jaws and Claws. What I want to do tonight is really to start at the very front of Scotty and work our way all the way to the very back and to talk about some of the unusual quirks of Tyrannosaur anatomy. Some of the things that make Tyrannosaurus rex a weird dinosaur, some things they're just particularly fascinating about it, and things that we don't often hear discussed uh, in, in the popular media. And so we'll get started right at the very leading edge of Scotty. We'll start right at the tip of the Tyrannosaur and begin with the absolute front of its snout. Now, of course, the skull of Tyrannosaurus rex, the skull of any animal, your skull, for example, is not composed of just one single bone. Rather, your skull has got lots and lots of separate bones that are tightly sutured together. If you look closely uh, at this mound of Scotty, and this is the mount that appears at the T-Rex Discovery Center in East End, you can probably notice that right here, there's a little, what looks like a little crack. Well, that's not a break in the bone. That is where you're seeing the edge of one of the individual skull elements. And then it goes right up, right along there as well. That is a bone that we call the premaxillary bone or simply the premax for short. And on Scotty, we can study this bone in great detail because the skull of Scotty has actually come apart. All the different skull bones that were fused together in life are actually separate on this specimen. This is an unusual thing about it. Normally, they're still tightly stuck in there together, and so it's hard for paleontologists to study the different Tyrannosaurus skull bones from every single angle. Now, just to orient you here on this exploded skull, over here is where the nostril would be. Uh, up here uh, is the orbit, so where the eyeball sits. And then, of course, there ought to be teeth running all down the lower jaw here and all throughout the upper portion of the skull. But they're not there. Most of the teeth in the Scotty specimen have also fallen out of their sockets. So that's our premax right there. And here it is in isolation. And if I flip it over, so right now you're looking at the outside edge of it, but I flip it over and you look at the inside, there you can see these big canals running through it. Those are the sockets where the premaxillary teeth would have been positioned. And the premax teeth of Tyrannosaurus rex are extremely unusual. In fact, they're so unusual that they really threw early paleontologists for a serious curveball. Now, here's an assortment of teeth uh, from Scotty, and I actually happen to have a cast of one uh, right here. Of course, Tyrannosaurus rex has really, really uh, big teeth. Now, in your mouth, you have got lots and lots of different kinds of teeth. That's something that's uh, pretty unique about mammals. We've evolved lots and lots of different tooth forms, which let us in some cases eat different kinds of food, but also to eat the same kind of food in slightly different ways. We can use our front teeth to nip off a bit of Thanksgiving turkey, and then we can chew it up with our rounder molars in the back. And most dinosaurs aren't like that. Indeed, most of the teeth in Scotty are all pretty much the same. They've got the same basic shape to them. They've got these big, scary, enormous, banana-sized uh, daggers of death. But you will notice that on some of these teeth, they may look a little bit larger than others. Well, that's just because in some of the teeth, we have got the root preserved. It's a cool thing about Tyrannosaurus rex. The upper part on the tooth that you see there, that's the crown. It's super shiny because it's covered in enamel. That's the only portion of that tooth that would be sticking up out of the mouth. Everything below it is the root. 
Tyrannosaurs have really, really long roots. You can see the root, the part of the tooth that is embedded in the jaw and not sticking out is actually much larger than the part that would be poking out. Tyrannosaurs need really, really large deep roots because they help to solidly anchor the tooth in the jaw so that when Tyrannosaurus rex bites down onto a duckbill or a triceratops, and that herbivorous dinosaur, which doesn't want to be eaten, starts to struggle and thrash and starts to pull away, the teeth of Tyrannosaurus rex don't give out, they don't break away, rather they hold on fast. Now, on one of these teeth, you can find a serrated edge. We've zoomed in on one of Scotty's big fangs here. You can see all those little bumps right there. Bump, 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 bump. That line of bumps works just like the bumpy edge on a steak knife. It's there to carve through flesh and help the tooth to cut. And tyrannosaurs, uh, like most theropod or two-legged median dinosaurs, have got two serrated edges per tooth. They've got one here on the back edge running down and then also one on the front edge. So one on either edge, just, uh, uh, just the ideal form there for slicing into meat. Such that if we were going to perform a cross section of one of these teeth, if we were going to cut into it and stare down the barrel of a Tyrannosaurus Rex tooth, this is the form that you would see. It would be like a double teardrop to it, right? We have one serration right there, making it look pinched, and one serrated edge there, making it look pinched. On a dinosaur like Velociraptor, all the teeth are like that. You can see the teeth right up here at the very front in the Velociraptor premax look just like all the teeth here in the back. Same simple form all the way across. But if we look at a premax tooth from Scotty, we see something strikingly different. Indeed, this happens to be a premax tooth. Look at where the serrations are. We don't have a serration right here on the front edge, and we don't have a serration right here on the back edge. Rather, both of the cutting edges of this tooth have been moved along to the sides. If we stare at it like this, there you can see one running there and one running to that side, such that the cross section of a premax tooth for Tyrannosaurus rex is not a double teardrop. Instead, it's been described as having a D-shaped cross section with a rounded edge in the front and then a flat edge in the back. So Tyrannosaurus rex has got two different kinds of teeth. Now, this was confusing to early paleontologists who would often just find the shed teeth, so loose teeth from an animal not associated with the rest of the skeleton. And in particular, they were thrown for a loop when they found the teeth of young tyrannosaurs, a big tooth like this. Well, if you found this in the Cretaceous out in the Badlands, you wouldn't think twice about what dinosaur it came from. Must be from a great big tyrannosaur. But you find a tooth like this, a smaller one, with that strange D-shaped cross section to it. And early paleontologists actually thought they'd found the tooth of a brand new dinosaur. And it was given a name. We named these teeth a blissodon, meaning backwards flowing teeth because they were so unusual. Well, as more and more specimens of tyrannosaurs were discovered, paleontologists eventually figured out what was going on, that T-Rex and other tyrannosaurs just have this very unique tooth form in the front of their mouth. Well, what's it for? An important thing to consider here is that when you look at the jaws of Tyrannosaurus rex and you imagine this animal biting down on something, you can see that the first teeth that would penetrate into its prey are the great big teeth here further back in the mouth. Indeed, you can see how the jaw has got a curve to it. It goes down such that this is going to be the lowest point. These are the teeth that stab in deep and do a lot of damage. These teeth here actually see very little action when it comes to chomping off big hunks of meat and doing a big bite uh, to wound a triceratops or something like that. 
Rather, this series here of D-shaped teeth in the front may have let Tyrannosaurus rex use the front of its mouth the same thing, the same way that we're able to use ours. We've got little incisors up here that form a straight uh, back edge to them, and that makes them very, very good at nipping. Tyrannosaurus rex was a big nipper with these specialized premaxillary teeth. Uh, it could go in and do fine work removing small bits of meat off of carcasses that the great big teeth in the back were just too large of an instrument for. Moving on, I want to talk about what comes directly behind the teeth of Tyrannosaurus rex. I want to talk about Tyrannosaurus rex tongues. Now, when I was a kid, I liked to draw all sorts of illustrations of Tyrannosaurus rex. I wasn't very good at it, but I liked to do it. And I often liked to draw the tongue of T-Rex sticking out. And I drew it as having a long forked tongue, just like, say, a Komodo dragon, or just like many modern day monitor lizards, and just like snakes. And I'm not the only one that thought a long tongue Tyrannosaur would look pretty gosh darn neat. In fact, some of the original work done for the film Jurassic Park, some of the original test footage that was done depicted the film's velociraptors as having very long tongues that they would flick out a great distance just like lizards do. And the creators thought that was a really cool thing to try to show. But the film's scientific advisor, the paleontologist named Jack Horner, put a stop to that. He told them that giving these dinosaurs long tongues was bad science. And as it turns out, he's absolutely right about that. And that carries over to Tyrannosaurus rex as well. We have very good reason for thinking T-Rex did not have a long, uh, highly mobile, certainly not forked tongue like a lizard. And how can we take a guess at that? Your tongue is composed of muscle. So it's made of soft stuff. And soft tissue very seldomly winds up fossilizing when you're looking at animals as old as dinosaurs. But we can often judge uh, the size of different dinosaur muscles by looking for clues on the bones where those muscles would attach. Now, wait a second. You don't have a bone running through your tongue, and neither did Velociraptor, and neither did Tyrannosaurus rex. But we do, nonetheless, have a bone that's present at the back of the throat, which is where the base of the tongue, very important tongue muscles, are attached. It's called the hyoid bone. And if you have a look at this skull and skeleton here of a Komodo dragon, you can see that it's got a really big hyoid. There it is, located right there at the back of the skull, and it runs all the way down. It's actually a really, really large hyoid. The Komodo dragon needs a big one because it's got this highly flexible, very, very important tongue. Other lizards have got complex hyoid bone, bones too. In fact, the chameleon, which shoots its tongue way out, has actually got a hyoid that's got sophisticated joints to it that can move and rotate forward as the tongue is projected. This is a large size hyoid. And so we can ask the question, well, do we have a hyoid for Tyrannosaurus rex? And if so, how big was it? A big complex hyoid would suggest T-Rex was doing a lot of crazy tongue stuff. Well, we do not have a hyoid preserved for Scotty, but another Canadian Tyrannosaurus, this specimen here at the Royal Tyrell Museum, an animal nicknamed Black Beauty, does have a hyoid preserved. Here it is. How big is this Tyrannosaurus tongue bone? It's only about 10 centimeters long. It's not even as long as the hyoid of a Komodo dragon, which of course is much smaller. Indeed, relative to its size, Tyrannosaurus rex has got a hyoid that seems to be much smaller than even our own. So Tyrannosaurus rex should not be drawn with a big forked tongue coming out of his mouth. I was wrong to do so. Instead, when you imagine the inside of a T-Rex mouth, a scary view, you should think of it as having a fairly short and simple tongue.
And if you stop for a second, that does kind of make sense because the last thing a T-Rex would want to do is to bite its own tongue. Um, moving on up towards the top of the skull, some of you may have noticed on this beautiful illustration of the head uh, of Scotty that our Tyrannosaurus Rex here, I, our tyrant king, has got something of a crown. Tyrannosaurus Rex is illustrated here with a number of small horns on its head. It's got this little cheek stud right here, and then it's got a big uh, bulbous horn right there on its forehead. Well, if we go back and look at our skull of Scotty, you can see evidence for those Tyrannosaurus horns. There's one right there uh, on top of the head called the post orbital boss. And then there's also another one right there that's called the jugal horn. If we zoom in, you can see the post orbital boss there, a very large, robust structure. And here's our jugal horn. Notice it's got this sort of pitted, uneven texture to it. It's not nice and smooth like the rest of the skull bone. In that way, it actually has a lot of resemblance to this fossil here. This is kind of another dinosaur horn, although it's not from the head. Uh, this is an osteoderm or a scoot, a piece of body armor from a herbivore, a kind of armored dinosaur, an ankylosaur. That pitted, uneven texture that you see on the surface there is where blood vessels would be flowing across the surface of this bone. And they're there because growing on top of it was a covering of horny material, keratin, the same stuff that covers the horns of modern day cows and goats. In fact, the same stuff that makes up our fingernails. And the presence of that similar texture tells us that the horns of Scotty were also covered in that same material. So again, when you're drawing the head of Tyrannosaurus rex, keep in mind that it is a dinosaur that has got horns. The function of those horns in T-Rex remains something of a mystery. They may have been, at least in the case of the jugal horn, quite sharp. They may have protected the Tyrannosaur when other Tyrannosaurs came to try to bite on to the side of its face. They may have also provided a little bit of helmet, a little bit of cushion uh, for the skull if the T-Rex ever got uh, beat up there on the head as it was often putting its face in danger. Moving back now into the body of Tyrannosaurus rex, I want to talk about the figure of T. rex in general and what the contours of T. rex's stomach ought to be like. Now, on us, our stomachs will be very, very hard for future paleontologists to take a good guess out just how much gut what sort of belly we've got uh, sticking out past our ribs is really, really hard to judge. But it would be easier for a Tyrannosaur. Here now is the new mounds of Scotty at the Royal Saskatchewan Museum. And you can see positioned right here along its belly, there are all these strange, thin, spindly bones. These are called gastralia. They're also sometimes referred to as belly ribs. And you can see their position right here in front of this large boot-shaped bone there that's called uh, the pubis. And the function of the gastralia is probably to help the Tyrannosaurus rex breathe. There are muscle attachments on the gastralia, so they are mobile. They could flex and move to let T-Rex take in a great big breath of air and then compress and help the animal squeeze it out. And modern day crocodiles have got gastralia as well. Unfortunately, we don't normally find Tyrannosaurus rex gastralia preserved in three dimension. They're usually a mess, lying every which away and have been squashed flat by the sediments and rocks that have piled up on top of them, uh, still making it very hard to reconstruct what the contours of the gut ought to be like. Should T-Rex have a great big bulbous belly, or was it a leaner animal? Well, taking a look there at those gastralia inside view, we'll rotate now to a different specimen. Uh, here's one in Belgium. You can see it's been reconstructed with great big broad gastralia really sticking out high, such that they go at the back much, much further apart 
than where we see the pubis. This implies that Tyrannosaurus would have a really, really big, broad, hulking belly. Now, you might be a bit skeptical of that if you look at the position there of the leg, because it almost looks like the knee of Tyrannosaurus rex is going to be stabbing into its own gut, and that these contours would limit how a Tyrannosaurus rex would run. Well, another specimen of a related Tyrannosaur uh, at the Royal Tyrell Museum finally gives us a view of three-dimensional gastralia preservation. And there you can see they take on something of an intermediate form. The gastralia here up towards the chest are really, really broad and wide. But as we progress towards the back of the animal, they become increasingly yeah. narrow such that by the time we reach the big pubic boot, they are no wider than the hip itself. And the leg has got then plenty of room to swing past them. So again, when you're reconstructing a Tyrannosaurus, keep in mind those specific contours. Tyrannosaurus rex, as it turns out, should be reconstructed with a very wasp waist, but then expanding out to a broad chest. If we then look back at the Royal Saskatchewan Museum's Tyrannosaurus mount and we stare at it from above, you can see that here the reconstruction is correct. Really, really broad right there and then getting narrower as you approach the pelvis. I'm pleased to say that the Royal Saskatchewan Museum has the world's most accurate T. rex belly. Getting back a little bit further, uh, I have to say a few words about the foot of Tyrannosaurus rex. And this, by the way, isn't it. Here you're looking at the foot of another large carnivorous dinosaur, one that's older than Tyrannosaurus rex. This is the foot of an animal called Acrocanthosaurus. Still, the overall shape of the foot is quite similar to what you would see in T. rex. Most meat-eating dinosaurs have got three forward pointing toes, just like a bird, and then a much smaller toe that's positioned backwards, again, as is in the case of most birds. Now, unlike us, most dinosaurs walk on their toes. So for us, we walk on the flat of our feet. And so those bones that are in our feet that run from the ankle up to our toes, uh, those are positioned flat on the ground. But by standing up on their toes, meeting dinosaurs raise those foot bones. And those are the three bones you can see right here. Those are called metatarsals. Now notice that on this acrocanthosaurus, which for our purposes represents the form you see in almost any other carnivorous dinosaur, you can see that those three metatarsals are about equal in size. Now let's look at the foot of Tyrannosaurus rex. And suddenly things are a little different. To begin with, T. rex does still have three large forward pointing toes and a little toe there in the back. But have a look at those metatarsals. Here's one on that side. Here's one on the other side. But look at the one in the middle. It has a very strange shape to it. As it progresses up, it becomes super duper pinched. As it runs upward, it gets really, really, really tiny, really, really narrow right there. This is unusual foot form, and paleontologists have a fancy name for this. We refer to this as the arctometatarsalian foot condition, which is a big mouthful, but all it means is that the inner metatarsal is pinched between the two on the outside. Now, why would that be the case? Why would Tyrannosaurus rex uh, have this unusual foot form? Well, the answer is that by having that central metatarsal pinched, it helps to hold the bones of the foot tightly together. That makes the foot of T. rex very, very resistant to stress and strain. It prevents the bones from popping uh, out of alignment. 
This is a great adaptation uh, if you're going to be an animal that's putting a lot of stress on your foot as you're running or turning quickly. It gives Tyrannosaurus rex a lot of competence uh, in maneuvering around. Now, my colleague, Dr. Eric Snively, thinks that the Arctometatarsalian foot may have done a little bit more for T. rex as well. You'll notice that there is some space right here. There's sort of a joint that's formed by these various foot bones. And that means that as the central metatarsal makes contact with the ground, it might have had the flexibility not to go side to side, but to be pushed upwards a little bit. And then being wedged between the outer three, that could have built, with the aid of some additional ligaments, a little bit of elastic rebound. So the weight pushes it in, and then the two squeeze it back down, effectively giving Tyrannosaurus rex a little extra oomph. The feet of Tyrannosaurus rex then might have been spring-loaded. And with every step that T. rex took, it would compress the central metatarsal and let it spring back a little bit as it goes. Again, a good adaptation uh, for moving around uh, more quickly and perhaps more efficiently. Finally, we come to my favorite part of the Tyrannosaur, and I mean this sincerely, we're going to talk about the tail. I love dinosaur tails. Uh, that was a major focus of my research at the University of Alberta. Whenever I tell people I'm a dinosaur tail expert, uh, they usually blink a little bit and say, oh, well, isn't it interesting how specialized you can become? And they're right, of course, dinosaur tails is certainly an area of specialized interest, but gosh darn it, they're an important part too. So on Scotty here, being a huge animal, it measures uh, about 13 meters in total length. And let me point out to you that more than half of that length is tail. This is a huge investment on the part of the animal. Tyrannosaurus rex, uh, has, has made its tail composed of bone and muscle, which is expensive stuff for the animal to produce. Looking at this from the perspective of Darwinian economics, the tail must have been of vital importance, else why would the animal spend so much resources in order to grow it? Well, if you read in most children's books, though not mine, uh, about the function of the tail of T-Rex, they will give you what I refer to as the seesaw explanation. The idea that meat-eating dinosaurs from Velociraptor to T-Rex are built like seesaws because they stand on two legs. With a great big tail uh, out here, my head, the arms, and the skull on this end needs the tail in order to keep itself balanced or T-Rex would fall flat on its face. I'm going to make the argument to you today that that explanation is insufficient, that in fact, there's more than junk in the trunk of Tyrannosaurus rex, and that tail is not simply dead weight. Now, considering what the function of the tail might be presents us with something of a problem. Because if we look at modern day big animals that we often like to use in, as analogs for dinosaurs, things like rhinos or hippos or elephants, they don't have a lot going on. Big mammals have got very small, reduced, just sort of fly swatter tails. Similarly, if we look at modern day birds, living dinosaurs, they've also downsized their tail. Oh, they've got a lot of feathers, but the bones underneath are really quite short. They do not have tails that are equivalent to those of most uh, extinct dinosaurs. A better comparison in this case might actually be a Komodo dragon. Komodo dragons, uh, lizards, uh, and as well as uh, crocodiles have got long tails with lots and lots of muscles and bones. If you look at this Komodo dragon in rear view, you can see that there's this big bulge right here at the base of the tail. It's not a flat, tiny fly swatter. It's this huge, girthy thing. Why? What's going on there? Well, when I was working as a master's student at the University of Alberta and I was curious about dinosaur tails, I performed a bunch of dissections 
on lizards. I dissected chameleons, I dissected basilisk lizards, which are lizards that actually run bipedally. I did a, a tegu, I did an iguana, and I did a, a caiman, a, a crocodilian, which is close living relative uh, of dinosaurs after birds. So I cut into these specimens, I peel back the skin and the scales, and I look to see what was underneath, what was responsible for this big bulge. And here is what I saw. Underneath the skin and the scale here, we've got one enormous muscle. It's a great big muscle that we call the caudo femoralis. If you go to a Cajun restaurant, or if you go by one of the local restaurants here in Charleston, South Carolina, and you order yourself gator tail, this is what they will serve you. It's in fact, one of the largest muscles in an alligator's body, far bigger than any muscles located up here in the leg, far bigger than any muscle located uh, in the skull. It's a really, really big muscle. If you're good with your Latin roots, you may know that caudo refers to the back or the tail and femoralis refers to the femur, the femur being the upper leg bone. It gets that name because although this is a big muscle positioned in the tail, it is attached by a tendon right there to the femur, to the leg bone. And being a leg muscle is actually the primary role of the caudofemoralis. When an alligator or lizard takes a step forward, and then goes to pull its body, to hoist itself over, to move itself forward, it contracts using this great big muscle in the tail. So lizards and crocodiles are tail propelled animals while they're walking around on land. This is the single largest hind limb retractor muscle that they've got. And here's where a paleontologist gets really, really excited. Because if you look at the femur, that leg bone, you can see clearly on the bone where this muscle attached. It attaches right here at this big crest of bone that we happen to call the fourth trochanter. So the question you should all be asking yourselves right now is, well, if I looked at the femur of a tyrannosaur, would I see a big fourth trochanter? Because just like looking at the hyoid to tell us about the tongue muscles, looking here at the attachment site for this muscle on the leg bone would tell you something about its size. And the answer is yes, absolutely. Here's the femur of a tyrannosaur, and right there is the fourth trochanter. It is, in fact, quite large. So a tyrannosaur should indeed have a very large uh, caudofemoralis muscle. Well, after that, I went around to various museums and measured lots and lots of different uh, dinosaur tails. I took that data and I created computer models of those tails. And I also created 3D models of the skeleton of all the reptiles I had dissected. And I came up with a method for charting on the bones of the tail where this caudofemoralis muscle was positioned. And once I came up with a system that would give me a good solid estimation for the size of this muscle from chameleons to caimans, I felt comfort comfortable applying it then to a dinosaur. And here's the reconstruction of the muscle for a Tyrannosaurus rex. And as it turns out, here's all the other muscles reconstructed on it uh, as well. And as it turns out, when I did that, Tyrannosaurus rex did not wind up having a caudofemoralis muscle that was as big for its size as what we see in crocodiles and lizards. In fact, it turned out to be even larger. And again, if you stop to think for a moment, that does make a lot of sense. Tyrannosaurus rex is a far more athletic, more active animal than a Komodo dragon or a crocodile. It's an animal that needs to be able to maneuver and run around on land a lot. So it's not surprising then it would have a bigger investment uh, in this tail muscle. And you can see the trick that Tyrannosaurus rex used to give it a supersized caudofemoralis muscle based on this tail vertebra here from Scotty. So you're looking at just one of the bones that 
comprise the tail. You have a whole series running down, running down, running down uh, across it. And I'll draw your attention very quickly to these structures right here. These are called caudal ribs. They stick out to the side and it is underneath them, positioned down here, that the caudal femoralis sits. And in tyrannosaurs, like most carnivorous dinosaurs, they are raised up. If this was a tailbone of a Komodo dragon or a crocodile, those caudal ribs would be positioned right along here, much further down. But by raising that muscle, uh, that, those caudal ribs upwards, the Tyrannosaurus rex has gained an expanded region for the caudofemoralis muscle to fill. And it's the only muscle that's there. So it's got to be what is occupying that extra space. So the beefy end of a Tyrannosaur, as it turns out, is super sized. So if you all remember nothing else from today's talk, please remember this. When you think of Tyrannosaurus rex and Scotty, do not think of it as a seesaw. Instead, I encourage you to think about T-Rex and its tail like a Volkswagen Beetle, because it's there in the trunk that the animal is generating all of its locomotive power. Thank you all very much. Uh, I hope uh, you enjoyed that. Let me say thank you again to the Royal Saskatchewan Museum. I hope you'll all consider participating in their other events, in particular, their dinos uh, in 3D. And let me also say uh, thank you uh, to Beth Zakin, who is the illustrator uh, of my book and is responsible for many of the illustrations that you've seen uh, throughout this talk. Um, and now, uh, if anyone has got uh, some questions for me, uh, Annie, we'll, we'll do our best to accommodate that.